Radiation Units and Health Applications of Radioactivity. Okay, so this is basically our introduction to nuclear chemistry. And the first thing we're going to talk about are radiation units. So in nuclear chemistry, we're going to be talking about radioactivity. And there are various units that we use to quantify this radioactivity. So the first unit we're going to talk about is the Curie. And this is the original unit. And it's defined as the number of nuclear disintegrations per second. Now, this was specifically defined as the number of disintegrations that occur in one second for one gram of radium. So you can see here the Curie, which is uh, abbreviated with capital CI, is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 disintegrations per second. Now, the Becquerel is the SI unit of activity. And it's defined as one disintegration per second. So you can see that the Becquerel is abbreviated with capital B Q and that's one disintegration per second. Now, other measures of radioactivity are based on the effects that it has on living tissue. This is important because radioactivity can transfer energy to tissues. And it does it through two ways. The first one is kinetic energy of the particles hitting the tissue. And the second is the, in the case of gamma rays, the electromagnetic energy that is absorbed by the tissue. Now, either way, the transferred energy damages the tissue. So it can da damage the organs, whatever it comes in contact with. The first unit for basically you know, this, this type of measure of radioactivity is the RAD. And that's an acronym for radiation absorbed dose. It's equivalent to one gram of tissue absorbing 0 0.01 joules. Okay, so you can see that one RAD 0.01 joules per gram. The gray is the SI unit for absorbed dose, okay, and that's equal to 100 rad or one joule per kilogram of tissue. Now the rad is more common, okay. Now just to get an idea of, you know, of what effect this would have, let's think about the absorption of only one rad by 70,000 grams of water. And so that's approximately the same mass of water that would be in a 150 pound person. And when that happens, the temperature of the water would only increase by 0 0.002 degrees Celsius. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but it can break one times 10 to the 21 carbon-carbon bonds in a person's body. So that's a lot of damage and it would not be desirable, clearly. Okay. If we want to predict the effects of radiation on the body, it's also complicated by the fact that uh, different types of emissions affect various tissues differently. And so the unit REM, which is an acronym for Röntgen equivalent man, is defined as one REM is RAD, so radiation absorbed dose, by some factor. Now factor is a number greater than or equal to one, and it takes into account the type of radioactive emission and sometimes the type of tissue that's being exposed. So for beta particles, the factor equals one. So we're gonna talk about beta particles later in this series. For alpha particles, which we'll also talk about, when they strike most tissues, the factor is 10. But if they strike eye tissue, the factor is 30. Most radioactive emissions that people are exposed to are on the order of a few dozen millirems, okay? So that's gonna be one one thousandth of a rem. So a medical x-ray is about 20 millirem, and a sievert, capital SV, is a related unit, and that's 100 rem. So let's look at some of the sources of exposure to radiation. Radon gas, medical sources, so various medical exams, radioactive atoms in the body naturally. I bet you didn't know that there are those included. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, terrestrial sources, cosmic sources. So for instance, if you fly from New York City to San Francisco, you're going to get five millirem uh, radiation exposure because the plane flies above the atmosphere and the atmosphere protects us from the cosmic radiation. And so that's where we're going to get our cosmic sources. Consumer products are going to add a small 10 millirem, clear energy, 0 0.05 millirem. And so the average person is exposed to 358 millirem per year. 
and notice that fully 82% of the radioactivity and radiation exposure we receive is from natural sources that we can't avoid. So if that just gives you an idea, our bodies can tolerate a little bit. Okay, so let's look at some of the uh, effects of short-term exposure to radioactivity and radiation. If we have one rem of exposure, so remember the average annual is 358 millirem, which is less than a rem, then we're gonna have no detectable effect. So basically harmless. Nothing that we can detect anyway. If we have 20 rem exposure, then we're gonna have increased risk of some cancers. If that goes to 100 rem, then we're gonna damage our bone marrow, we're gonna damage other tissues, we could have internal bleeding, and we could have a decrease in white blood cell count. So these things are not good. By the time we double or triple that, 200 to 300 rem, we're gonna see visible burns. We're gonna have nausea, vomiting, fatigue. If it's greater than 300, we're gonna lose white blood cells and our hair. And if it goes above or around 600 rem, we're gonna die. Basically, the actual effects of this radioactivity and radiation exposure um, on our health depends on the type of radioactivity, the length of exposure, and the particular tissues that are exposed. So there are some variations in there, so you can see hence the approximate on a lot of those values. I mentioned that we have radioactive elements in our bodies. Okay, so here's the list of radioactive isotopes that exist in our bodies. Potassium-40, carbon-14, there's a decent amount of those, so you can see the decays per second that are going on right now inside you. Uh, 87 rubidium, okay, and then the rest of these, just to add, you know, very small trivial amount decays per second. As far as applications of radioactivity, irradiation of food is one. And so basically, if you expose various foods to radioactive substances, then it will kill microorganisms and it'll extend shelf life in that way. So we can use that with produce like tomatoes, mushrooms, sprouts, berries, and these are irradiated with the emissions from cobalt-60 or cesium-137. And it kills many of the bacteria that cause the spoilage. We can do this with eggs and some meat, so beef, pork, and poultry can also be irradiated. Now this is really important because that might scare you. Irradiation of food does not make the food itself radioactive. Basically, we're exposing the microorganisms who are absorbing it, and as we talked about it, they absorb the radioactivity and they, it damages their tissues and they die. But when we eat that food after that, the food itself is not radioactive, so it won't damage us. It just kills the microorganisms that are on that produce. All right, we use uh, radioactive isotopes in medical imaging. So here is a, a thyroid gland and we can use radioactive iodine to do this. And you can use it for diagnostic purposes, which is basically to image it. And you don't need very much radioactive material for that. So, because that, that radiation is very easy to detect. Now, if we had a thyroid tumor and it, one was def uh, detected in these scans, then we'd need a much larger infusion. So more like thousands of rem as opposed to a diagnostic dose of less than 40 rem of iodine-131 that uh, could help destroy the tumor cells. All right, another interesting uh, application of radioactivity is the PET scan. You've probably heard of that too. And so that's a positron emission, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and that's from fluorine-18. It's a very, very important medical diagnostic tool. It's called positron emission tomography and that's a PET scan. So positrons undergo instant annihilation when they collide with an electron. So basically it's an example of a mat matter-antimatter annihilation, okay? I don't expect you to understand that right now. We'll talk about that more later. But when this occurs, there are two high energy gamma rays that are produced. We'll talk about gamma rays also. And they exit the scene of the annihilation in exactly opposite directions. And with that, gamma ray can be detected and we can basically get a 3D picture showing the intensity of the emission and that's gonna give us a picture of the organ. Now, if you do get a PET scan, you're gonna be given an injection with FDG, it's fluorodeoxyglucose, 
and that's a sugar analog. And it's absorbed by the body, metabolically active cells, and it's going to accumulate and undergo uh, positron decay. After, you know, you're going to wait a little while and then there, a scan is going to be done using a circular array of gamma radiation detectors. So again, so that'll, that'll give us a 3D image of the organ that we're looking at. All right, so here's an example of a PET scan. So this is the human brain. Some of the other radioactive isotopes with medical applications. So 32 phosphorus, 59 iron for anemia diagnosis, cobalt 60 for gamma ray irradiation of tumors, technetium 99 and that little m means it's a metastable form of this isotope. The 131 iodine, which we just talked about, uh, 133 xenon for lung imaging, and 198 gold for liver disease diagnosis. So lots of applications for radioactive isotopes.